Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Emily Rapley, Managing Editor with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your controls panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We're looking forward to hearing your questions. Additionally, in about a week following the webinar, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation to the email you used to register. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenter. Jonathan Wick has over 20 years of experience in healthcare, and he has worked in both the acute and insurance setting. He has a bachelor's degree in sports medicine and holds two master's degrees, one in healthcare administration and one in business. Jonathan actively serves on the Colorado HF MA board and is president of the board of directors at an assisted living facility in Boulder, Colorado. Mr. Wick has spoken at several national and state events and has developed several nationally recognized programs in point of service collections, financial clearance, and sharing best practices in hospital operations. Jonathan currently serves as principal at TransUnion in the Healthcare Solutions Division. Jonathan enjoys spending time with his family in Colorado, has a wonderful wife, and two very energetic redheaded boys. He enjoys doing anything in outdoors and is a certified whitewater rafting guide instructor. He also enjoys traveling and has visited several continents, including a six-month stay in Antarctica and the South Pole. Jonathan, I'll now turn the floor over to you. Great. Thanks, Emily, and thanks, everyone, for taking time out of your extremely busy day. Um, and uh, pardon me for disrupting it as much as the government is in, in spending time with you today and helping you uh, uh, position yourselves as this legislation has been unfolding or not unfolding as we learned over the weekend. <clears throat> uh, we'll have some time at the end to uh, have some Q&A uh, as we go. I should finish hopefully around 20 till or quarter till. Uh, so uh, write those questions down. Um, there's a place you can submit them as well. Um, and uh, we'll try to address as many as we can. And then if I can't get to them in the time that we have, I'll, I'll certainly uh, do them uh, as the week progresses. Our plan for today, I, I want to give you an overview of the ACA disruption, um, share some insights on, on how if you haven't already kind of put together a, a task force or a team or, or structured your, your organizations to uh, meet these changes uh, where you can um, uh, capitalize on some opportunities in time. Uh, we, we were afforded a little bit more after the polling of the bill Friday. Uh, uh, overview of kind of where we sit today with the ACA remaining and the American Healthcare Act getting pulled. Um, what we may expect uh, from Congress and some of the other constituents uh, on a go forward. Uh, they've, they've indicated for the most part that they've moved on uh, and they're talking about tax reform and, and certainly energy. Uh, I heard that this morning. Uh, nonetheless, healthcare is here to stay and, and uh, it, its funding is certainly a, a big part of the government's agenda. So I do think it will come back up, but uh, uh, they're going to they're gonna, uh, play another game for a while and then maybe switch tables. <laughs> um, so we'll see where we end up. Uh, it, we'll also kind of revisit what the ACA was intended to do, you know, about eight years ago, and then what actually happened and, and what we think may happen uh, on a go forward from there. Um, there's some pretty complicated slides uh, when we get to that step, and I'll try to walk you guys through them, but they really do paint a good picture of the constituents of the provider, the payer, the patient, and the employer in terms of how all this legislation and, and funding has been impacted. And then finally, I'll finish with just some best practices that I've had. Uh, in visiting hospitals in my role now, at my, in my prior role as a chief revenue officer, and just things to think about and, and ensure you, you have. And, and by all means, I want to be a resource for you at any time. Uh, we'll have a, 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 a web page at the end, too, that we're going to share with you uh, that, that talks through, you know, how we can kind of keep the conversation going. But I want to make sure that we're, you know, attacking this on all fronts and, and insulating revenue and making sure that uh, hospitals are doing well, because that's, that's what's important to our country's health care. All right, well, let's give a, a small healthcare state of the union. So the President of the United States cabinet's, you know, been evolving over the past few months. He's, he's been in office a little under 70 days. Um, you know, he appointed Tom Price. Uh, Ways and Means and Energy Commerce Committees were extremely busy over the last few uh, weeks uh, driving the, the bill. Um, lots of legislation to look at, though, as, you're, as you all are well aware. Um, tax reform, trade, immigration, education. Um, healthcare has been taking the front seat. It was a front seat, certainly, uh, during the election. Um, uh, President Trump has made it uh, certainly part of his platform uh, and, and, and has been talked uh, about uh, both by the media and his cabinet in terms of what they want to do. And Tom Price has certainly um, been and very vocal about uh, uh, reforming some of the things under health care uh, with this new legislation. Uh, the ACA uh, has been, been in place for some time and it is not something, as we realized Friday, 
uh, easily changed, um, and there still are lots of differing opinions on it. Uh, that said, budget reconciliation um, is likely to occur, I feel. Um, things like the Cadillac tax, premium subsidies, individual mandates, and other things are still going to get touched um, as the year progresses, I predict. And, and we may or may not see um, uh, you know, big changes to the ACA bill itself. However, you may see uh, um, some, some uh, material changes to how health care is funded um, from the government standpoint, from a tax base and, and things like that. And we'll talk through some of those idiosyncrasies, but that seems to be the strategy du jour, um, at least the GOP, GOP is to look at what is, uh, where the money is going and, 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 and manipulating that in a way that allows uh, the ACA to not succeed. And we'll talk through that in, in, uh, in, in, in detail here in a little bit. Um, the repeal and replace bill failed. Uh, if you were in a cave, maybe you didn't see that, but uh, the ACHA uh, Reform Act, uh, it, it uh, was polled on Friday. Um, I've got some information uh, here in a few slides that will talk through that. Uh, and as I mentioned, you might see, we, I think we're still going to see some, some, some formative changes in Medicaid, employer, and individual mandates. Um, the executive order that Trump had in January is still out there. Um, uh, how the enforcement of some of these rules happen under the new legislation is still questionable. Um, so we really want to just understand all those uh, different drivers and, and uh, motivators as they're there. Uh, transparency, you're seeing a lot of momentum there. Um, it's not a word I'm necessarily wild about. I call it the T word. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you've seen uh, legislation from Paul uh at the federal level. Uh, House Representatives Bill 372 was introduced as an amendment to the ACHA uh, last week, um, and it talked about uh, providing, uh, you know, estimates to patients uh, in advance. Uh, there was legislation filed by the Ohio Hospital Association as well um, that's currently in an injunctive status um, for transparency bills where they said that the cost of implementing said rules would impact patient care, and so they're kind of in a holding pattern. Um, uh, I reside in Colorado and have helped in the legislation here as well um, and served with, with different bills and talked to the Colorado Hospital Association quite often, and um, there are some uh, transparency bills here, and I'm sure many of you listening on the phone um, have some others that, that may or may not come up uh, as we go. So I do think you're going to see transparency um, take a front seat for some of this because there, there, there does seem to be some um, uh, chips being put in front of the patient understanding what their costs are and having that help drive um, decisions and costs and access and things like that. Uh, Value-based care, that, that road's been paved. Macro and MIPS um, are certainly something that are going to continue uh, and because uh, they address health care costs and outcomes. And, and you didn't see much of those being touched in the A, in the proposed bill. And, uh, and uh, Senator Pri or Secretary Price has also mentioned that, you know, he wants to kind of watch those play out with the ACOs and see what's happening and, and doesn't really want to um, impact those because they, they are uh, a bridling mechanism at, at most right now, and, and uh, they're, they're not really impacting some of the other things that have had more political football thrown. How's this impacting, you know, the provider market? Well, I think disruption is going to continue. It's certainly, um, we, we're in an ebb, ebb phase right now, not a flow phase. We had a big wave coming Friday, and that kind of ebbed back out, but I do think it is an ocean, and you're going to continue to see that pattern lapping against the shore, if you will, of, of little bills coming here and there. Um, and, and legislation get introduced. Um, as an example, we'll talk about this in a little bit later, Medicaid uh, has some enrollment, and ACA has some enrollment rules that are proposed right now under Secretary Price, uh, talking about the enrollment period for the exchanges um, and some other things that, uh, you know, that are still going to occur outside of these giant bill introductions and, and, and things that you hear about um, with your coffee in the morning. So, you know, before Friday, I had a, a, a negative outlook for hospital providers with the bill um, based off what the, the Congressional uh, Budget Office was saying and, and, and Standard & Poor's and some other uh, groups talking about this bill and how it was going to impact access and costs and um, increasing uninsured rate uh, significantly. Um, I've changed that to uncertain um, uh, over the weekend just because, you know, we're kind of in a status quo, if you will. Um, for the time being, but, but uh, there are other uh, pieces of legislation that are, that are floating around and, and certainly some uh, uh, politics will still occur, I think, uh, as the year progresses. We'll see what happens in the 2018 plan year uh, at the very least. So here's some key committees that uh, really control, um, uh, you know, where money is spent and appropriated um, from a federal standpoint. Uh, uh, Paul Ryan, we've heard a lot from him lately, but he chairs the uh, Ways and Means Committee. Um, Fred Upton, uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, Michael Mulvaney of the OMB, 
Um, he had some comments, uh, you know, surrounding the impact of the bill uh, from a financial standpoint. You've got uh, Orrin Hatch on the, on the Senate side and the Health Committee of Lamar Alexander. And then, you know, Trump did appoint Tom Price. Uh, he's a uh, orthopedic surgeon out of Georgia um, as the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, and uh, he's been very vocal about uh, what he intends for this country's healthcare delivery, um, uh, both in his uh, time uh, in Congress and, 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 and now as an appointed role as a, a, the, the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services. So I, I think, you know, depending on what priorities uh, end up on the wheel and, and where uh, the politics play out, um, these folks certainly are names that you will see um, and what's important to understand is that they uh, all are from a similar party, although as we discovered on Friday, that party does have some fracturing in it as well. Um, but it's interesting to see um, uh, the, the domain of control and where that may or may not uh, drive uh, pol policy uh, for healthcare. I put this grid together, uh, you know, over the last few months, I guess, and it's kind of evolved as things have changed. It's a a little bit to digest, but a question I often get asked in my role is, you know, what do you think, John, is going to happen with the rules and the and the and and the uh, you know all the noise that's out there, and 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 you know what, how's it going to impact the stakeholders that 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 play within the healthcare space? And um, it, it, one thing I've learned is you can't be too predictive, and you don't want to certainly close any doors. So I kind of establish some valences, or you know, is it going to be a positive or a negative impact, and then establish some timing um, in the effort to not be too vague. Uh, I will be uh, completely transparent and honest with you. Um, I had hospitals providers uh, at a negative at the midterm uh, at, as, as late as, as of Saturday morning um, just because uh, of, you know, that bill and its impacts to them. I, I changed that to a more neutral impact. I think at least for the, for the plan year that we have in place, we're going to just continue to see where we're at. I did remain uh, keep that negative in the in the long term because I do think given some of the rules that are out there and 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 given the uh, just the legislative change of guard, you, we will see some more disruptive activities politically that will that that certainly um, are not going to impact uh, hospitals providers in a in a uh, positive manner. Uh, you uh, the AMA and the AHA have been very very vocal. Um, to the current legislation. Uh, there was a letter called Do No Harm that was sent, I believe, from the AMA to President Trump, and, and the AHA has also um, had several position papers surrounding, you know, what they feel the ACA is benefiting and, and where they feel um, there are opportunities. And I, I believe, I don't believe anybody um, would assert that it's a, a perfect system. Uh, nonetheless, um, it certainly has uh, helped impact the uninsured and provided more access um, it has helped uh, hospital providers profitability um, and uh, and certainly has, uh, you know, garnered uh, much attention uh, in terms of talking about Americans and their access to care. Uh, employers, on the other hand, uh, you know, I've kept this the same. You know, they've been uh, shouldering the burden of financing health care costs in our country um, ever since World War II. And, and given um, you know, that shifting in deductibles and premiums and things off to the patient, uh, the employer mandate certainly did not help them. Uh, and having to carry uh, uh, legislative rules along with all the other rules that they have hasn't helped them as well. And so I think they're going to end up in this disruption uh, probably making out better than others um, just from a, a, a financial standpoint um, in that they aren't required to meet this bar or, or leverage uh, the financing as they go. Consumers and patients are neutral. I do think there may be a negative impact uh, over the next year or so as the rules change, and we'll get into those in a minute. Um, insurance carriers, I think they are neutral as of now, but um, they, uh, you know, may have some relief um, with NLR ratios or or some of the exchange plan uh, uh, coming out in terms of you know offering choices and, and not having uh, profitability concerns for their shareholders. I think they'll they'll have a positive outcome in the long term. The industry as a whole, I debated. You know, I think it's neutral now. I don't think you're going to see the industry come out of this negative after this is all said and done. One thing that's nice, gang, is that it's being talked about, right? And one of my one of my favorite little mantras is the first step to recovery is admitting there's a problem, right? And healthcare in America certainly has its challenges, and so looking at it, be it legislatively or as a group, will have positive outcomes. You, you know, we're not going to 
stick our heads in the sand and not look at it anymore. So I do think looking at it, regardless of your opinion or where you're coming from, will end up having long-term positive solutions for the industry as a whole um, as we progress. So let's talk about the bill. I'm not going to spend too much time, you know, uh, getting into the into the details here, but we it, it, it had an approach of, of obviously repealing the, the ACA, um, replacing entitlement subs, uh, tax subsidies with credit. Um, it, it kept the exchanges. Um, it had a penalty if you lapsed coverage. Uh, it encouraged health savings accounts. Um, it had innovation grants. Um, it kind of kicked the can down the road a little bit for Medicaid funding um, for the match to 2020. Um, uh, and didn't touch that. So it was uh, pretty neutral in terms of some of the things uh, in getting. Uh, where we ended up uh, having some issues is uh, it didn't address cost. And uh, Standard & Poor's had this uh, statement made where they said, in addition to the future growth of, of high deductible plans, combined with greater levels of uninsured people, this could result in higher health care costs to consumers. Um, and so uh, they felt that this would actually add pressure to the industry and not help it, and uh, and came out and uh, had a, a, a ratings um, a statement surrounding the impact of the bill itself. Uh, uh, Con Congressional Budget Office, you've probably heard this already, projected that the number of people without health insurance would grow by 14 million under the new Republican um, Obamacare replacement bill, and uh, th with that number rising to 24 million in a decade, that would basically reverse. Uh, the effort that the, that the ACA had put in place um, for uh, providing more insurance for Americans. Um, and so, you know, they said, well, who's going to pay for that? And then uh, I've seen, you know, astronomical numbers in the billions and millions talking about the cost of that uncompensated care. And uh, we'll talk through that here in a second as well. Uh, Medicaid, obviously, at the local level had some very, very uh, uh, heated and, and uh, uh, polarized responses. Um, uh, Republicans, uh, regardless of their affiliations, did have constituents in their states um, that, that did elect to expand, um, and, uh, and some of this may have uh, impacted that or not, and so they felt that a, a complete repeal of the ACA without a replacement plan um, would involve um, some unpopularity within their state's constituents. Um, regardless of that, I do feel that Medicaid restructuring is probably going to happen as the ship con in a key mentions here, you can't get the same out of Medicaid. I don't know where else you're going to get them. The fact is, is that healthcare costs are rising. They have leveled somewhat, but that, you know, Medicaid represents one of the primary funding mechanisms and Medicare and, and around 57% of the country right now either have one of those two um, per an AHA survey. And so that is where the cost savings are going to have to come from, um, from a, from a government standpoint. And then from a, uh, a private sector standpoint, these ACOs and the, and the MACRA and MIPS and things um, are, are hopefully going to design some innovative methods to control uh, commercial uh, at-risk plans as well. But if you're working in the industry, it certainly has moved from a, f a fee for service to a fee for value um, and, and fee for outcome market, and, and that's in increasing pressures to the uh, providers as well. A house divided will fall. Republicans were short of the votes. Um, I, I saw news between anywhere between 50 and 35. I actually was coming off of a raft trip, and my uh, email was lit up like a Christmas tree Friday um, from different folks saying, oh, my goodness, look at the bill may not make it, and, 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 uh, and here we are. Um, Freedom Caucus and Coverage Caucus you know, made their points well known, and, well known and, and concessions for one group certainly repelled the other. Um, uh, Rodney here, he's the House Appropriations Committee Chair, in addition to the loss of Medicaid coverage to so many people in my state, denial of essential health benefits in the individual market raises serious concerns. Um, I consider this a straw that broke the camel's back. Once this went out, the vote started swaying, and, and, uh, and that was the end of it. And then we saw um, uh, Mr. Ryan um, uh, approach and say Obamacare is the law of the land. It will remain the law of the land until it's replaced. We'll be living in it for the foreseeable future. How long that future is and where we end up is, is yet to be seen, but this was his announcement on Friday. Another grid with, with just some impacts. You'll notice the bill at the top, the ACHA bill is there. Um, Price had a bill um, as well. Trump had a seven-point plan, Ryan's Better Way plan. There was a Patient Care Act that was presented during the Obama administration. Um, and uh, HFM uh, had an article in 2017 in January um, that also had uh, many of these elements. So I kind of put them in there, but it's, it's, it's interesting to see where there are green checks and red, red X's. Um, across there, and this ACHA bill, you know, tried to meet as much into the middle as they could, 
Um, they knew that they weren't going to get much Democratic support, um, and so they were trying to at least align the party, um, and they got close, I think, uh, but you'll notice something that's very clear on here is that the individual and employer mandate is axed um, consistently across all of the uh, viable replacement plans. President Trump announced on Friday this was interesting, uh, to say the least. We learned a lot. Uh, we learned a lot about getting votes. We learned about the rules of the Senate. Um, and and uh, it'll be an experience that leads to an even better health plan, uh, he feels. Uh, Kaiser family uh, had an interesting statement as well. The Trump administration now faces a choice whether to actively undermine the ACA or reshape it administratively. And I'll talk about some of those things uh, here as we get into the deck. Um, rather than, I, I love this from Pascal. He said, rather than repeal a place, it could be instead called reform or retain. I think this probably has the most likelihood of getting some legs, um, at least um, some help from the Democratic parties if we can. Um, medical, medical regulations could be reformed, um, but many subsidies could, could be retained, and, and, and reform might end up being repealing elements of the ACA, but the folks would be on recruiting the health system as a whole, not just simply you know, yanking it out, replacing it. I think as you heard these bills come up, um, every uh, a person that was against it said, you know, you can't just yank coverage out and pull the rug out from 20 million people. We've got to come up with something that replaces it. And then the discussion and the debates happen about what that replacement plan looks like. Um, and so Pascal kind of had an interesting um, reform and retain uh, position here. We could see if that's where we're going to end up. I, I remember 90 days ago, repeal and replace wasn't even a, a, a household term. And now you say that people know what you're talking about. Um, I don't know if reform or retain will, will um, uh, garner that much attention, but it certainly is interesting to, to think about. This is that executive order I alluded to earlier. Um, uh, he, uh, he released this in January. Um, it's still out there, and it, it, it is a policy to seek prompt repeal of PIPACA. Um, and in the meantime, any such repeal is imperative for the executive branch to ensure the law is being effect, efficiently implemented taking all actions consistent with the law to minimize the unwarranted economic and regulatory burdens of the act. So if you're circling anything or when you get this deck, highlight that next to the last uh, line there. Um, that's the big thing. And so um, interpretations I've seen on this executive order is, you know, is the employer and individual mandate going to be enforced? Um, and, and what does that look like? And, and as you, you saw in that grid before, those were the things that there was um, a resounding agreeability to. Um, the law is the law. How it's enforced and interpreted is, is um, Secretary Price's issue. Um, and so I think you're going to see a lot of, of dialogue and debate surrounding whether laws are being enforced or not in this legislation versus this repeal stuff. I think that's going to be the shift that we see as we go. So how is this going to impact uh, the uh, people that are on it now? Well, you know, you pay your premiums and, and, and your coverage is ineffective. I do think there's going to be a little bit of a bumpy road in the next plan year. Um, uh, HHS has several rules that are being proposed that are expected to be approved here over the summer um, uh, surrounding enrollment periods, um, uh, how uh, qualifying events are documented. So, hey, I lost my job, I had a baby, or I got married, those types of things, um, how those are documented in terms of how you get coverage. Those rules um, are fundamentally um, proposed to change, and that would make it, uh, I think, more difficult to get onto a plan uh, next year than, than it would be this year. Um, Costs, uh, don't get me started, but I don't think anyone um, thinks that the ACA has really addressed costs in any sort of material fashion. It certainly addressed access. The a AHCA also did not, um, but we're going to continue to see the deductibles, co-insurance, and co-pays increase. Um, the bronze deductible is $6,100 this year. Uh, the silver is $3,600. Um, those are up 20 and 23% respectively from when they first started, and they're up 13 and 3 percent, respectively, um, from last year. And we all heard, you know, about the 26 percent increase in premium, and um, that varied anywhere between, for a Kaiser Family Foundation study, you know, uh, keeping the same or 145 percent uh, increases in an area in, in Phoenix. And so um, that, in combination with the the um, exiting of folks from the exchange, um, certainly creates some fragility in that market. Um, and we'll, we'll see, you are seeing a trend of, of folks pulling from the exchange market. There hasn't been many folks adding um, in there, and, uh, and that needs to be sustained and stabilized, and I think the legislation is trying to work on that as well. Um, co commercial and Medicare don't have any major impact changes. Don't hold me to that, but these bills and, and what I'm talking about today, there's certainly going to be changes, but, but the government's not going to have uh, much to do with them uh, from a material standpoint. 
Um, expansion will continue in non-expanded states. Um, I, I, I don't have the states off the top of my head, but the minute that bill got pulled, um, uh, a couple states had actually gone. I think Kentucky was one, and, and I'm, I'm going to go off on a limb. I believe um, uh, the other may have been Ohio. Um, but I'll, I'll double check that the Medicaid expansion states, uh, two states did come forward um, after the bill uh, went through, and, and uh, they're, they're, they're going to elect their um, uh, position as expanding. Um, and states could impact Medicaid enrollment with less oversight from the federal government. Um, PBS had some uh, interesting insights from that. Um, you'll see, I think, some pro uh, proliferation of the uh, uh, Medicaid uh, Section 1115 waivers, which I've got a slide on later as well. That grid I was talking about earlier um, that kind of talks about what the ACA was designed to do. So, you know, the government was going to put money in, the states were going to put money in, and that was going to help uh, folks get on, and consumers would hopefully, uh, you know, use the subsidies or the new enrollment provisions to either get on a Medicaid or the exchange plans. And that influx of cash would certainly um, help. Employers uh, would need to comply with the mandate or pay a penalty. Um, that hopefully was going to get payers um, playing ball and offering plans and getting them uh, in there and participating in the plans, and then that would uh, ultimately reduce uncompensated care for the provider. This was what was supposed to happen in the ACA uh, when it was launched. Um, what wasn't in the plan is a lot of states didn't elect Medicaid um, or expand Medicaid. They kind of kept things the way they were, um, and fewer consumers came to the party, the young invincibles, um, didn't decide to, to, to sign up. They said, you know what, I'm going to take the tax penalty. I'll use insurance when I need it. So, you know, I've heard people say they kind of came to the party and then they left. <laughs> they didn't hang out for very long. Um, so the, the individual membership growth did not grow as, as much as we had hoped and um, as much as the market had hoped. And, and the, the exchange plans are unprofitable. Um, and you've seen some uh, since that an exit um, uh, of that. And, and Providers also have this balance after insurance and uncompensated care issue that's starting to happen. And we'll talk about the patient being a new payer uh, here soon, but um, I think providers appreciate the, the uh, momentum and position the ACA has put us in. Uh, the high deductibles and the cost to collect issues are indirect consequences of having those types of plans in place. Some changes that may come from the federal government. Um, right now, Medicare and Medicaid are in a mandatory spending bucket. Uh, Secretary Price has been vocal in saying he'd like to move those to a discretionary spending bucket. Um, he's quoted here saying two-thirds of the current expenditures are dedicated to automatic spending programs, which are not subject to appro appropriations. Um, that's pretty spooky if you think about it, because we'd be putting um, uh, you know, our, our uh, uh, elderly and our under or uninsured into the same bucket as tanks and homeland security from a funding standpoint. Um, so I'm not sure how much legs this has, but it is possible under this legislation. Um, per capita or block grants are things that are still out there. They were elements of the AHCHA bill. Um, they have that 2020 rule. Um, you see what happens depending on the color of state that receives them. Um, states would get less annual aid, and I'll talk through each of these models in just a second. Um, Republican states um, that uh, either chose to not expand Medicaid um, or did not want the match would, would certainly slash those benefits to help save uh, state level costs. Um, and then uh, Democratic control will provide more state funding where the budget allowed. Um, think of a 2008 reset, you know, as we're in the hospital when we didn't have um, matching. Uh, Obamacare really did, you know, expand and get a lot of folks onto the Medicaid program. Uh, uh, first and foremost, I would, all, I would argue even more than the exchanges did, and that was the, you know, kind of the big tsunami that happened is a lot of folks got on the Medicaid that otherwise would not have. Um, where that money's coming from, be it the federal government, the state government, or both, is, is what's going to be discussed uh, on, a go, on a go forward. Uh, right now, we have a match program. As, you, as most of you are probably aware, matching states vary by state, population, and service. Um, $346 billion was a match to $205 billion in state funds. Um, states follow the rules. Um, they also can get DISH dollars, um, uh, GME payments, things like that. Under per capita, uh, the, the, the plans um, certainly change based off of uh, per Medicaid enrollee. So this is, hey, you got this many people on Medicaid, we're going to take a spot here and, uh, and say that's what you get, and, and it gets paid up to a cap. Block grants, they don't receive any more than a set amount, and that's typically allocated among states referencing on a uh, in a base year. 
And those caps could be frozen and, and, and uh, they would allow for cap payments to grow based on either a consumer price index or a gross domestic product. Um, this provides funding certainty to federal government. You know, they would know what that expense would look like over the next few years. Um, or over the, at least the next year, and states can elect the, you know, the rules and, and either, uh, you know, legislate or uh, understand that in their own budgets as they go. I'm not sure which of these are going to go, but they certainly have been talked about. I thought it would be um, good to highlight, you know, where they're at. The source is down there if you want to dig more in. Um, the issue with these grants, and I think the issue with any health plan, is that, you know, they don't really account for the, the, the what-if um, public crises, um, drugs that aren't covered or, or, you know, unanticipated health care costs. Um, uh, you know, those patients, if they are on Medicaid, would still require some sort of, uh, of, of funding through the Medicaid program, and if they were capped funds, the state or the hospitals would have to eat that amount, there'd be windfall from a payment standpoint. So it's just something to think about as these blocks of cap funding plans come off, um, regardless of the match. So that does bear risk uh, to the hospitals. Um, increasing enrollment and costs will no longer issue increased federal funding. So cost pressures may increase state to limit enrollment. They may change the benefit plans and the qualifying criteria. Um, and fewer covered lives could lead to more compensated care. Uh, Becker's actually had an article this morning on the CFO review that talked about how there may be a uh, Fitch uh, said that there may be an uncompensated care spike under the ACA regardless of any changes that happen um, just because of the exchange changes and, and, um, and uh, of where we're heading with some of this Medicaid funding. And, and you may see a 1% to 2% increase in uncompensated care over the next year um, given that. Um, and so this is just creates some disruption challenges for uh, a population health management as well. Additional Medicare changes, um, discretionary spending I mentioned. Uh, Ryan, uh, Mitt Romney and those guys remember this voucher stuff. Um, that's certainly uh, still out there. Um, you didn't see legislation specifically talk about it, but it, um, that voucherization of the program is something that's on Ryan's platform. And, and when he dusts his, his uh, knees off and, 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 and kind of gets back up on the horse and figures out where they're going and after they figure out tax and energy and gun bills and everything else, um, that might be something that gets talked about again. Um, and, and obviously having a voucher program could have adverse actions to the older, sicker, and poorer um, uh, beneficiaries as they couldn't afford the traditional coverage as we go. Um, regardless of what's happening with all of these bills, uh, you still have this long list of bulleted items that we that at least I feel HFMA feels and others feel that are that are going to happen. Um, they're going to see some changes in the Medicare Advantage plans. Um, uh, independent, independent review boards uh, uh, might get repealed. Uh, CMMI grants um, can get impacted. Um, physician-owned hospitals. We already saw that with some of the site mutual payments. Uh, Medicare Medigap reform may happen. Combining parts of Medicare A and B. Uh, uh, things to strengthen the patient-doctor relationship, especially from a privacy standpoint. Um, you may see some uncompensated care reform. Uh, mac macro and MIPS, um, you may see some parity in the Medicare Advantage plans, but that plans will stay. Um, you may see some different uh, kind of uh, innovative models surrounding premium support. I don't know if they come in the form of subsidies and other things, but um, HSAs and things like that. Pharmaceutical tax, medical device tax, Cadillac tax, um, CHIP plans, PDUFA, and the Medicare Independent Payment Advisory Board are all things that are on the docket. There's a dedicated bill for the pharmaceutical bill, um, uh, taxes from a free, free market trade standpoint. Medical device tax is a component of the ACA, is, as is the Cadillac tax. But since they're taxes, those other committees I mentioned at the beginning can be, they can be administratively touched through something called budget reconciliation. And so just something to think about that uh, these, these uh, uh, pieces of legislation can come up for debate as we progress. So these slides, the next two are probably the most important ones in the deck. So if you've been kind of multitasking, it'd be time to pay attention. So these are some things to think about um, with the disruption as we as we progress. You know, macro myths I think are going to persist. The advantage plans are going to align with commercial insurance. ACOs are going to continue. Um, they're all going to stay gang. Um, the American Journal of, of Managed Care said this as well because they control spend and outcome. And those are two things that I think anyone can agree on that we need to look at. Um, and the HHS model is, is getting defined. Tom Price was confirmed. You saw the executive order I showed you. And um, uh, Verma, who is over CMS now, um, came out of, I believe, Indiana. And she had a demonstration program there with these Section 1115 waivers that was very, very successful. So I think you're going to see the approvals of these waivers um, happen uh, more prolifer uh, uh, more more, more frequently um, as they come in. And so that's another way to kind of allow the states 
um, to uh, manage their own risk pool and their own money um, and, and kind of bypass some of these provisions of the ACA. Uh, medical payment concepts, uh, reform concepts will be debated. I, I've mentioned that, the block per capita grant. Um, states will move to federal risk pools um, based off where we're at. You, you know, with the expansion, um, I think you will see some new states with the ACA getting pulled. Um, Medicare could become a voucher program. If that brings up, that will be extremely popular to debate. Um, so we'll see where that ends up. But uh, these are all things that are, that are certainly um, uh, things that should be top of mind for providers as we go through. Deregulation is going to happen in insurance. They've mentioned that. Um, uh, the, they, they said we can't follow these rules. We know how to manage risk. We've been doing it for 50 years. We can do it, thank you very much, on our own. We don't need the government to tell us how to do it. Um, and so uh, I think you're going to see in this legislation um, uh, continued easing of the, of the, of the bridle <laughs> um, uh, for that. Um, you might see some um, changes in guarantee issue in the individual markets. Employer-based uh, insurance uh, will still remain the primary source. AHA's payer mix still predicts about 50 to 57% CMS um, for Medicare, Medicaid, 35% commercial, 10% self-pay, 5% other. Um, uh, they, they, they release that uh, every couple of years, and, and that's an interesting document to kind of look at to see where they, they see the, the predictions to happen. Health benefit exchanges, the mandates, and the insurance plan provisions will increase in complexity. Um, those are those rules I mentioned that are in place are uh, being proposed to pass in June. Uh, transparency, as I mentioned, will have quite a bit of momentum. Um, it is a term broadly used in the market, and it's very misunderstood. Um, the reason I kind of take issue with the word transparency is you can have as much legislation in the world that talks about how much things cost, but unless you start talking about how they're going to get funded, all it is is a bill that says, here's my price. And so there hasn't been much study that say, or outcomes that say, if people knew the price, they would change their behavior. If they knew their out-of-pocket costs, they might. And so transparency kind of needs to have both edges covered. And, and most of the legislation out there is like, show your price. Well, that's a meaningless number for most of us that work in the industry. Um, a charge description master price um, does not um, necessarily uh, uh, impact um, what the costs are or reflect what those costs are to an organization, to a hospital. And so looking at them and figuring out you know, where you end up and and what the patient's going to do off that. I, I used to say, I can tell a patient all day long that their MRI is $1,500, now what? Um, and so a transparency bill that, that affords that doesn't afford the other things. And Paul Mutter's bill gets to some of those levels. I would argue some of them are burdensome, but it does kind of couple that patient and engage them financially as we progress. Unknowns and a very, very packed legislative. Um, Trump and the legislation have their hands full. Um, as I think any legislation has. Healthcare reform is at the top of the docket. The tax is now getting talked about. Energy is getting talked about. Um, there's some immigration stuff, the AKA wall and everything else. Um, education bills, VA bills, trade and energy are all things that need to be addressed. Um, healthcare was at the top of that list. Um, as of last week, it's getting subordinated by some of these others now. And like I said, who knows when we'll come back to that other table. So after that kind of fire hose of where we're at, I, I wanted to end, you know, my talk today and then, uh, address some questions on, on things you can do. Um, as I mentioned, the patient's a new payer. Um, in 2002, they represented about 10% of your uncollectible or your collectibles and your AR stream. Um, right now, they're about a third of that. So that's those deductibles, co-insurance, and co-pays. And patients are, are not great payers. Um, uh, as low or hate, Medicare is a very consistent payer. They pay me every month. On the, on the same day, and, and um, they may not have paid me what I was supposed to get paid, but I knew I was getting paid. Um, and, you know, patient, it, that dunning cycle and statement cycle could be very, very um, volatile depending on where they're at. And if it's 30% of your dollars, given some of these deductibles, which are very, very high these days, um, that becomes um, difficult. And I think with this disruption, either with the increase in enrollment in the uh, bronze and silver plans, as I mentioned, a $6,100 deductible in bronze and a $3,600 um, deductible in silver. Um, there's studies out that show most patients have about 400 bucks in their bank account that's liquid. Um, and so that puts you $3,200 underwater on the silver plan. Um, and so there's lots of studies out there that show how patients have to borrow money on an encounter because they just aren't anticipating that cost and, the, and the, um, there hasn't been a proactive financially engaged conversation. So treating the patient as a payer is an important positioning uh, tactic for hospitals and providers. Um, best practices, this is from the HFMA Friendly Billing Project, and, you know, charge master, pricing strategy, clearly defined to make sure your, your volumes are retained and that your, your costs are closely aligned with your reimbursement. 
and vice versa. Insurance eligibility, verification, pre-cert, medical net, medical neck, um, uh, referral authorizations, um, identification, you know, kind of fraud detection, active financial counseling, including payment plans and alternative payment arrangements, and you know, these special handling accounts. This is the blocking and tackling in a revenue cycle, gang. You got to hit all of these, um, otherwise you're going to leak revenue. And and I know you go, you're all doing them. How well are you doing them? Are you doing better, worse, than the same you did last week? And is this disruption going to impact that performance as legislative bills come in? Just think of each of these items as different things come in, like transparency or enrollment provisions for qualifying events for Medicaid um, or funding changes happen at the state level. Those types of things or exits or entries into the market for the health benefit exchanges occur. Where are your, where are your hospitals checking those information? Where are your folks doing that? And how's that looking is something to think about. Every access point is an opportunity to financially clear a patient, whether they're coming in um, pre-care, um, whether they're at scheduling, pre-reg, reg, or post-discharge. These are the big five, I call them. You have the time that they talk to the doc that they're getting something ordered, the time they call you to get it um, on the books, the time someone makes a call to them or they make a call to you to confirm things, the time they show up, and before they go home are five big gates that you can look at to um, ensure that you've financially cleared a patient and established funding mechanisms for them um, and so that everyone's um, on the same page in terms of who's going to fund that care and where that funding is going to come from. The screen allows you to segment those accounts. You can put them into FPL buckets, ability to pay buckets. Um, uh, really want to, this is kind of the, the, the secret sauce now is, is, is bad debt segmentation. You know, put the high risk patients into a bucket, let your team work on them. And that high risk could mean one of two things. I don't have a funding mechanism for them or the funding mechanism is something that they can't afford and figure that out as they progress. Hospitals that do this have a between a 10 and 30% lift. Um, when they're stratified in their bad debt. That's significant. Um, and so, you know, take a look at that and understand how you're going to stratify that either pre, during, or after service to capitalize on those five opportunities that I mentioned. Here's an example of a segmentation bracket, um, self-pay or high balance after insurance. You guys can kind of uh, let your fingers do the walking. What's important are the colors over to the right. You know, what does your charity policy say? What does your bad debt um, uh, uh, and, and collections policy say? How are you discounting? Are you stopping the line as things happen? Are you allowing things to happen for free or are you establishing funding mechanisms as you go? Those are all important things to think about as you progress. This is an example of what a batch can look like if you did it pre-service. You can also do it post-service depending on how you position your um, uh, 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 patient population. But the segmentation I think is going to become increasingly important as you establish your risk with all of this disruption. Another strategy is to discover coverage, um, and if that coverage is not there, then to find a funding mechanism outside of it, be that charity or Medicaid. If you can't find them, if, if after that, you're to determine once you've discovered what the coverage is or what the coverage is not, how is the patient or entity going to pay you? What is the likelihood of payment? And then differentiating between that ability and likelihood of payment is kind of the key to the kingdom if you can do that with all of your patients. And then certainly putting these into the, the right lanes and letting your teams work on the right patients at the right time for the right reasons. Those of you who have been on my talks before have seen this workflow. Um, there's a toolkit that we can get you as well. Um, but this kind of has a happy path on the left. Insurance is there. Insurance is covered. The offs are in place that meets medical necessity. I've done a I've done an estimate. The patient can afford it. They're going to pay me. The middle path is a disruptive path. It doesn't meet medical necessity. I can't verify eligibility. The patient can't afford it. And over to the right is an assistance path. But it's kind of a good checklist to follow as you go. I've got more information on this if you need it. High balance patient workflow helps you through those segmentation buckets, as I mentioned. And more importantly, over to the right, how is your early out self-pay functioning? And how is your third-party collection? I'm seeing a trend where that's starting to be brought back in-house with some of these tools where you're not paying some other guy to go get your money or you're letting them work on the hard accounts, but you're collecting the easy accounts. So these checklists and gates are all very, very important to get at whether the person's eligible, whether the insurance that they have or not is covered, whether or not they can afford it, and whether or not you have a likelihood of collecting it. And using these things in, in, in terms of either electronic transactions, manual transactions, your own homegrown tools or third-party tools are key to making sure that you can um, succeed as things get disrupted either by 
um, your own state level government or our friends up in Washington. I want to keep the conversation going, gang. Those of you that have attended this will get an email from us talking about a LinkedIn group that will be exclusive to you that will keep the conversation going. And um, when that invitation comes out, join in there. And you could, you know, agree or disagree with what I've said today, um, I provide some more insights, but I really want to kind of keep it going because I think the more of us that are talking about it, the better we'll end up. And then this is also going to be a patient access learning portal for us to talk through, you know, resources and best practices and share them. And it's an exclusive site from TransUnion that we want to give you guys. And um, please feel free to sign up. And, and I promise it's going to be more about thought leadership um, than anything else. And, and it's just going to be a place for us to all talk about what's going on and how we want to attack it. That, in a nutshell, is where we ended up. So I'll uh, open it up for questions. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, so we will now begin today's question and answer session. As a reminder to our audience, you can submit any questions you may have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. And we'll try to get through as many questions as we have time for today. Um, so to kick us off, a first question from an audience member is, do you know if there will be any impact to the veterans health care or military health system? You know, I haven't seen a lot of legislation about the VA benefits and, and, and others at least proposed. And I follow this stuff pretty closely. I'm an NPR junkie. Um, my radio is tuned to it often. And, and you know, I subscribe to Beckers um, uh, and, 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 and follow that. I have not seen a lot. I think we kind of have to learn how to crawl before we walk, before we run. And I think you will um, see it after we start figuring out the ACA stuff. But it's kind of taken a second, a second fiddle, if you will. Um, you know, it got a lot of attention from an access standpoint last year in terms of, you know, long lines and and, and things like that, and and and, and uh, veterans uh, wanting to get health care. Um, you didn't hear a lot of it during the debate. Uh, you know, you heard more about, you know, how health care is going to get funded and how the tax base should or should not have a role in that, and and how we're going to address costs and access and how the states are going to manage this and whether the exchange plans have some fragility. You didn't hear a lot about the VA, and I haven't either. Um, when I do, I'll let you know, though. So join that form at the end and put it in there. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, so our next question is also related to um, the impact of recent political events. Um, do you know the impact to prescription drug access for Medicare patients? Yeah, so Part D of Medicare um, it came under quite a bit of debate, um, you know, during the last legislation. It, it hasn't came up. Now, there is a pharmacy bill that's out there, and I'll try to pull it um, for this group and post it in that uh, forum uh, that's being debated now. And that kind of went quiet when everything else bubbled to the top. I, I don't know that it's going to touch the Medicare benefits necessarily. It's going to talk about more on how uh, pharmaceutical uh are purchased and the cost of them, and then the 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 thought is is that if the country and patients and providers spend less on drugs, healthcare costs will come down. And to afford that, we need to fast track things like the Cures Bill, you know, that allowed you know FDA rules to somewhat be light uh, uh, lessened a little bit, and then maybe free market trade, uh, love it or hate it, for pharmaceuticals. You know, there's two sides of the coin on that. You know, the rules are in place to make sure drugs are safe and being provided in a manner. Um, to where they're they're meeting the needs and demand. Um, when we're relying on other countries, it may be cheaper, but the the surplus may not not happen, or the demand may outweigh that. So, but all those things are being debated. That bill is looking at all of those pieces, and I'll get you that bill, and, and we'll take a look at it. I I haven't seen it get presented. I got a buddy in Washington that I'll ask as well to see if, if we can see if that's coming soon. But it but it it kind of sat down on the bench while this other stuff was being played out last week. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, so for our next question, how much of a focus do you anticipate providers will place on improving the patient experience in light of all these uncertainties and reimbursement concerns? What types of approaches do you think they will take to better achieve this? I see it as the improved. forefront. Um, you know, something that wasn't in my deck, but it's in a lot of others that I've seen and also done is, is that you're getting paid now, gang, from CMS as part of the elements of, of, of those HCAP surveys, right? And so, you know, it's not on whether you saved their life or not or made the knee better um, and those types of things, although those are all outcomes and great. They're, the patient, though, when they're filling that survey out, were you nice? Did you help me understand my bill? You know, all of those things are things that are going to come up. I think, you know, 
one of the mantras I have as well is that a patient's first and last experience with a provider is typically a billing one. Hi, Mr. Wick, welcome to my facility. I need your ID and insurance card. Um, and then a bill comes in the mail. And so those two things need to be very, very elegantly presented and provided um, to uh, the patient to where they feel they um, have an advocate and a partner as they navigate their healthcare costs. And that needs to be the mantra. I always said the goal is not necessarily to collect money. The goal is to help patients understand their costs and fund their care. And, and if you make, the, make it about that, that experience becomes way, way more collaborative than, um, than polarized. Um, there's a white paper coming out too that we're gonna do that, that talks a lot about those strategies and how engaging the patient financially and having them um, be a part of that process versus kind of sitting on the sideline and waiting for an envelope in the mail um, causes issues. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we have an audience member here that would like to have you explain budget reconciliation. <laughs> um, I, I'd like the audience member to explain it to you. Know, I'm um, so <laughs> budget reconciliation is a process that doesn't require vote um, through, uh, uh, through the House, if I believe it. So budget reconciliation involves presenting a tax bill through those committees that I mentioned, and then having it passed very quickly by those committees and then being presented. And then what can happen in those is that you don't necessarily repeal a bill or present another piece of legislation. You present regulations and other things that impact fundamentally how that bill is going to be governed or administered from a budgetary or tax standpoint. Um, a perfect example of that is open enrollment periods for the exchange um, or, uh, ha uh, or uh, having a, a penalty applied for a patient that, uh, or for a, a, an enrollee that didn't imply their tax benefits. The executive order that, that Trump had uh, talked through um, making this less burdensome. So the IRS could come up with a budget reconciliation rule, pass it through one of those commerce committees and say, hey, we're not going to impose the penalty anymore for taxes um, on that. Yes, that impacts the bill. Yes, you'll hear debate about whether or not the ACA is being followed, but we've heard all that stuff before, right? So the budget reconciliation efforts create a path legislatively that don't involve impacting a bill directly is the short answer. I hope Perfect, that Jonathan. <laughs> yeah, that was a great overview of a fairly complex process, so I appreciate it. Um, all right, our next audience question. How will these changes affect self-funded employers for employee group health coverage? Yeah, so that's a tough one. So most health plans are governed by something called ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Securities Retirement Act. I'm, I butchered that, but those of you who've worked in the industry long enough know what ERISA is. A self-funded or ASO or administrative uh, services only plan falls outside of those rules. And they also, I think, fell outside of some of the ACA rules. And so um, if you're a self-funded plan, you kind of make your own rules. You set up a, a, a plan that um, uh, uh, has uh, you know, a risk pool set up by um, what the company feels it's going to put um, in there. And it's going to self-fund you know, the risk against uh, the, the, the claims risk in their own pool and do that. Um, that said, if you are an employer and you offer insurance to a health plan, you have to, involve, you have to follow, per the ACA, this employer mandate. This employer mandate says that you have to offer health, uh, health plans that have a minimal, minimum essential benefit. And, and if you're greater than 50 or more, you have to have this, you know, uh, it has to be a plan that has these benefits in it. It has to be uh, a plan that has um, a certain level of affordability to it and those types of things. But a, an ASO plan may have uh, provisions in it that cover certain things differently, but they cannot be less than those others. I hope I interpreted that the right way. The ASO and self-funded plans are extremely complicated under ERISA, but that's my understanding. And please reach out to me, anyone, if, if you feel I'm off base there. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, our next question from the audience is about prospective risk. How do you use risk models to determine utilization of services such as emergency or inpatient services? Yeah, so, you know, I think this is, you know, population health management 101. So you're seeing a lot of traction in this area, especially, you know, with the value-based care stuff and, and, the, and, and, and the ACOs you know, managing, you know, what predictive analytics you can apply to a patient population to improve an outcome. So outcome improvement measures that I've seen 
are admissions to the ED over a year period by the same patient? Is that one, six, 10, or 60? And why is it 60? Is it for pain management? Is it for cardiac arrhythmia? Is it for esophagitis? You know, what is the condition that's causing that? And do you have good mechanisms in your ED to triage that from a hospitalist standpoint or other thing? And, and to, to let people know that, hey, this is a frequent flyer to our emergency department, or every time we admit this patient, they stay in house for 25 days. Um, what are those care paths and what do those look like? Most hospitals and providers have um, analytic packages to kind of look at that as a one-off, but they don't have holistic alerts and kind of uh, a, 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 a change path or a, a, um, an actionable step that changes or at least advises physician or clinical behavior as things are happening. You know, hey, Dr. Smith, this is a patient that, will, that, that um, has been here 10th, 10th, this is the 11th time they've been here. Um, you did admit them last time, but Dr. Jones did. And when Dr. Jones did, he was here 25 days, and it wasn't at your hospital, it was at another hospital. And I think the sharing of that information um, uh, will also help with some of that. But that analytics really will help drive, I think, utilization down um, from an outcome standpoint, because I think hot hospitals are often put into a shotgun role where they have a patient, they got to do a best form. Sometimes that's watching them, sometimes that's up on the deck, and then now they've got a discharge and a disposition issue and a skilled nursing or an assisted living or a home health may be difficult to establish given the rules, especially if they're on a government plan. And so managing that whole continuum on what's the best level of care for that patient as they encounter each level with analytics can drive that. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so we have time for about one or two more questions. So try to squeeze these in. Um, the next question, do you think any other insurance companies will come back into the marketplace next year? Our county only has one to choose from that is not in network. Yeah, um, boy, I feel for you. I don't know if you heard my, my all. <laughs> um, there is a great Kaiser Family Foundation um, uh, uh, web, web page on this that talked about um, the uh, choices of exchange plans over the last three years. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big KFF.org fan. Um, uh, and I'll try to put that on my uh, forum as well, and, and uh, so you can kind of go out there and go look at it. It talked about the exchange plan trend being an exit, not an entry. And as I mentioned in my talk, you're seeing a lot of efforts in the new legislation and the existing legislation. I think that is one bipartisan issue that they all agree on in stabilizing that market. They've got to figure out a way to make this um, a – uh, a venture that is desired by the insurance company, the young invincible. Um, we already know that the, the ill and the underinsured are ones that are going to go in there and get it. That's part of the reason why we've seen the exits. But to make that kind of grow, because we know that a guaranteed issue individual plan market will have such a bad risk pool that that's not sustainable over time. And so these exchange plans need to come up with a way to allow for that to happen. Unfortunately, that has not been the trend, and you're seeing fewer and fewer choices and more and more exits. And I think we're going to see more of that unless there's some uh, uh, lightening of the load for the insurance companies to, to participate because um, they came in and had actuarials look at that PMPM PM stuff, and a lot of those actuarials were surprised by how little folks signed up like you saw in that circular grid that I showed you. Definitely. Thank you. Um, so we have time for one more question, um, which will have a bigger impact on hospital systems and why? Number one, the phenomenon of high deductible health plans, or number two, risk-based contracting through CMS or commercial payers? I think number two, just because that's going to impact all of your cheddar. <laughs> you know, how you handle high deductible health plans is going to be a function of, of the maturity of your revenue cycle. Um, you know, there's studies out there that say a lot of patients want to and will pay you on a high deductible plan. It's just a matter of getting creative and moving off of a traditional billing cycle. I think risk-based plans, you know, are different, right? If you don't make that finish line um, and, and come back, you're going to end up uh, in, investing money and not getting that coming back to you, and that will impact your P&L significantly. Um, dollars down the road, you all have been collecting money for patients for some time. It's integral and imperative to collect it up front and to have a financially engaged process for it because that bad debt risk issue is happening, but it's not nearly to the magnitude of having a risk-based contract because that's, that's, you know, in some hospitals, billions of dollars to the millions of collectibles that you might be getting from your patients. Definitely. Thank you very much. So it looks like that's all the time we have today. I want to thank Jonathan. That was an excellent presentation, and thank you to our audience for participating today. 
Enjoy the rest of your day, and we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Thanks, guys.